an ecologist. My name is Suzanne Simpson, and I'm an ecologist for Bayou Land Conservancy in Houston, Texas, usually coming to you from my backyard. But today we are staying indoors because we have some very enthusiastic yard work going on outside. And I'm not sure that you would be able to hear me very well. So we may end up getting a guest appearance from my dog. We'll see what happens. But I look forward to getting to your questions. So let's start. First, uh, Steve and Sandy Lentz asked if I would say something about uh, the scaly-breasted munia, which is a type of bird that we have started to get in Houston, Texas and other places around the southern United States. So a little bit of background. This bird, scaly-breasted munia, is not native to the United States. It's actually endemic to Asia, and you'll find it in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. Um, but it has made its way over to the United States because of the pet trade. It's a pretty popular caged bird to have. And so one of the reasons that we have established populations in certain areas around the United States is, first of all, we had escaped pets. And then for some cultures, it's popular to release finches as people get married or other significant family events. And so these finches have been released and there are breeding populations um, of pretty substantial size in places like Los Angeles, San Diego, Houston for sure, um, and then Miami and Pensacola. If you look on iNaturalist, which is a pretty popular place to make outdoor observations, in the southeastern United States, Houston, Texas has the largest observed population of these birds. So um, particularly, we seem to have a population that sits between west of I-45 and north of I-10. So the Jersey Village area, Spring Branch, um, Willowbrook, Greens Point, um, the southern part of the Cypress area, those are all uh, areas that get a fair amount of this bird. It's most often seen in flocks. I'll drop a picture of it in the comments. It doesn't look very much like any other bird around here, except for maybe a, a house finch, but its chest pattern is so unique that it's pretty hard to confuse with any other bird. So um, the growth patterns of the species, its propensity for aggregating in groups, and its adaptability to habitats means that it's probably going to grow in population in our area in the next 10 or 20 years. So right now it's mostly on the northwest side of town, and I think you would expect to see it expanding into areas like Sugar Land and over to the Kingwood Umble area with time. Its effect on native birds is not really well known yet. So it's one of those things where you never know whenever these feral populations are formed, you never know how it's going to affect native species. And that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on. But uh, if you do see one in your area, always a good idea to post it on um, eBird or iNaturalist so that scientists can get a sense of the scale of this population as it's starting to grow. So good question. Next question comes from Bob Good, who uh, sent me a picture of a red-eared slider and asked uh, how you can tell the sex of a pond turtle without picking it up. He says that the pond turtle slides off the rocks and somehow hides in the pond whenever he's around. So we've talked a little bit about sexual dimorphism. That's being able to tell the difference between male and females of a species. We've talked about sexual dimorphism in turtles and tortoises a bit on this program before. And like other species we've mentioned, red ear sliders, which are the most common pond turtle in our area, and it, they're native here, but they're invasive in other parts of the world, um, they do experience some sexual dimorphic characteristics. So I'm gonna go over all of them, and then we'll talk about which ones might be most helpful in this particular situation. So first of all, um, female red-eared sliders are going to be smaller than males. So first, you have to make sure that you know you're looking at an adult red-eared slider, which usually about five or six years old is when they get into the adult stage. And females are a bit larger, coming in between 10 to 13 inches. And then males go in at about 8 to 10 inches. So males are a little bit smaller than females. Um, the plastron, which is the underside of the turtle, male turtles have an indentation that helps with the mating process, 
while females are pretty much um, flat on, on the bottom of their plastron. Then the carapace, which is the, uh, uh, the um, top side of the shell, the carapace in the males is a little bit more rounded than that of the females. Um, I'm about to try and take my dog's collar off. Let's see if I can catch her so that we don't have that noise anymore. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. So the males are a little bit more rounded than the females are. Um, in terms of the, the claws on the turtles, males have a much longer front claw, which is also something that um, aids in the mating process. I think she's about to join us as a guest star. Um, and males also have thicker and longer tails than females do. So there are about five or six characteristics that you can put piece together to try and figure out which it mo most likely is. Based on the picture that I was sent, it's hard to be definitive, but if I had to make a guess, I would say probably a male because the, uh, the picture that I got had a more rounded um, carapace and that's usually the quality of a male turtle. However, if you're in the backyard and you notice that that turtle is greater than 10 inches um, from the top of the carapace to the back, then chances are you are dealing with a female. So keep your eyes out and if that, um, that turtle may not be fully mature yet, so if it does get bigger over time, that'll help answer your question as well. Okay, so let's get to the main topic of our discussion, which is the um, longly held debate on which is better for the environment, a real Christmas tree or a fake Christmas tree. So um, this is actually a pretty hotly contested question. Representatives from both the Christmas tree farming uh, industry and the manufacturing industry both have their canned statements ready on why theirs is the better option, or at least why their option really isn't that much worse. So for most of the parameters that you measure by, a real Christmas tree is going to come out on top as the better option for the, for the environment. It's the most environmentally, environmentally friendly option. It's more likely to be recycled. It produces um, fewer carbon emissions, and it often supports local businesses, which is great. A lot of the tree farms, especially if you are getting your tree farm from a local source, which I hope you would be, um, then that's helping to support those local businesses. However, 80% of the Christmas trees in people's homes are fake. So um, I'm not here to, to shame all the folks that have a fake Christmas tree. Um, these are usually made overseas and then they're shipped into the U.S. and most of them aren't recyclable. So one thing that you can do if you are a, a plastic tree aficionado is to make sure that you buy one that you like and are gonna wanna keep around for over five years. Once you have the tree for over five years, you're starting to catch up with um, the carbon emission footprint that that tree carries versus a real tree. Thank you, Hyla. <clears throat> I personally find it interesting how heated this debate gets because in the grand scope of what we are doing over the holiday season, our choice of Christmas tree is actually a pretty small decision. Now, small decisions are important and often those are the ones that we can control most, but it's also important to consider that um, things like our holiday shopping and our holiday travel are what is going to have the central impact on the environment rather than something like our choice of Christmas tree. So if I could make a suggestion to you, it would be that if you're traveling over the holiday season, fewer people are traveling this year, but that's gonna change at some point. Next year is probably gonna be different. If you're traveling, go calculate the carbon emissions of your travel on a um, carbon calculation website. Many of them are available to you and they'll give you a dollar amount of what is needed to offset those emissions. So take that dollar amount to offset your emissions and donate it to your favorite environmental nonprofit. And that is a great way to make your holidays greener. The um, nonprofits that are doing really awesome work can put that money to good use and it's a great way to offset the impacts that we all make on the environment during this holiday season. So I hope that that helps answer your question. Thank you for submitting them. 
If you have a question for Ask an Ecologist, you can comment on our Facebook page, send us a message, or send us an email to info at bayouland.org. I wish you a very happy Christmas tree shopping and decorating and putting up, putting up of lights. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Stay wild.